one, yeah. I, I need to read the manga on that. It's cute. It is the Super Clash Podcast, a podcast about shorter games. It is episode 60. I'm your host, Kale. Good morning. It's Connor. Yeah. Uh, it's not really in the morning now. It's kind of the morning. It's for our audience, man. I keep forgetting about that. <laughs> it's, it's noon for us, which is still the earliest we've ever recorded because we're actually recording on a Saturday, which I don't remember the last time we ever recorded on a Saturday. It's been a while. I think we've done a Monday. We have done a couple Mondays, but yeah. how was your week, Connor? Uh, a little bit busy, honestly. Yeah? Just kind of, it was hard to time hard to find time for everything yeah I, I i feel that it's been hot as balls this last week man oh yeah i mean yesterday at the time of this recording um we had a heat wave the heat index was like 105 degrees and here i am working in a warehouse and man i probably emptied my water jug probably four times Jeez, it was that fucking hot i know i've been feeling kind of like off and on a little bit lightheaded this week mm -hmm. and that's just because i don't i'm like trying to like drink water and stuff throughout the day but i'm just like maybe not getting enough you yeah, know maybe which made me sad because like the past weekend it felt really good at least down at the lake i went down to see my parents uh last weekend i brought kiva and it was just really nice to be able to see my parents and sit on the dock i did some fishing for a while and Nice. Um, Kiva got along with my parents' dog, Arya, fairly, fairly well. There were two spats they got into. Um, uh, first one is when we first got there and, um, I was still in the Frisbee and both of them went for the Frisbee. They got in a little bit of a tussle there, but mm. they were fine for the rest of the time. And then another time we just sat down to eat dinner and then they got into another tussle. No blood was drawn. I think, um, they were just trying to assert dominance on one another. Yeah. But other than that, they were great. That's good. This week, however, I got nothing. Really? No. It, it. I literally just worked, and aside from that, we. Oh yeah, we did get ice cream. Yeah, this, we did this uh, on uh, this week, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we tried out the new uh, uh, Nintendo Cold Stone ice mm -hmm. cream crossover things. Yeah, it was the first time I had Cold Stone in a while. Same here. Which and, it was very sugary. My oh goodness! Oh my gosh! I I couldn't have it because it was almost too sweet. Like the chocolate ice cream with the whipped cream, strawberries, and bananas. Like I was getting like a headache from how much sugar there was. So I kind of had to eventually just kind of stop halfway through. But yeah, well, they what had you do? The, the Animal Crossing, the Kirby, and the Mario Party ice creams. Mm -hmm. And the Mario Party one had freaking icing in it, like cake icing, and ugh. I'm still like thinking about that it makes me like kind of my stomach kind of hurts. Ugh, yeah, but it's too much. But it was just fun just sitting outside for we we sat out there for almost three hours just talking. Yeah, we stayed a <laughs> we stayed till they closed and they were kicking <laughs> us out basically. And we were living uh reliving past traumas of our lives, the uh, core memories. <laughs> oh, don't think about those. Don't think about those. <laughs> like I said, Connor, I I do think core memories are the ones you relive before you die. You know, when your life flashes before your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So all, the, all that trauma is going to come back when you die, Connor. Oh, that's the worst then. Yeah. <laughs> you think you'd be reliving the, the day you got married and the, when you played your first video game and the day you got, you got your animals, which those might still be there. Those are core memories, but those bad core memories are still going to be there. The one time you said something cringe in high school and everybody oh laughed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's talk about something else, Connor. Tell me about um, tell me about Comey. Actually, uh, Comey can't communicate. Um, I've only have read the manga. I finished the first volume a couple days ago, and I just started the um, the second volume. Nice. So I I know that you were kind of drawn away from it because you weren't too crazy about the animation. Yeah, I had been putting off watching slash reading this for a long time just because the art style is not really my cup of tea it kind of reminds me of like an early 2000s anime style a little bit mm -hmm. um so i finally just because i thought the whole concept of it was really cute i was like all right i'm gonna start the anime and i started watching the first few episodes i liked it a lot 
I went out and bought the first couple volumes of the manga as well. I have not read those just yet, but um, my wife and I finished the first season of Comey um, uh, a day or two ago, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And it's really cute. It's got some like kind of weird moments. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Because there's one moment in it. Because I, I was expecting this to be a full on slice, slice of life. Slice of life. Um, full disclosure, I have not seen the anime. I wanted to read most of the mangas first before I um, watched the anime. I just want to do something different here. I was not expecting for there to be a yandere yeah. in this story. Um, that's the point I've, I've I've gotten to. That's in the second volume. I'm not sure what episode that, that is on the anime. It's like the second or third. Really? Thing, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have a lot of reading before I wrap up the first season. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um. But I was not expecting that. Everything up to that point was pretty wholesome um, and really cute, especially when um, Komi calls uh, Takano, I think is his, is the main character's name. Tadano, I think. Tadano. And she can speak a little bit, but not much. I thought that was really cute and wholesome. And when they got to see her room, I thought it was cute and wholesome. And Oh, yeah. And then out of nowhere, this yandere com comes in. Um, kidnaps Todano. Yeah. And just, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it does go a little weird and off the rails at times. But I think as you get further and further into it, um, you'll kind of start... This I don't think this is spoilers. You'll start seeing more of a sort of romance forming between the two main characters. So that's that's it gets really cute. And... Uh, one of the other classmates ends up like picking up on this and is trying to like put them in scenarios where they'll like, you know, uh, be with each other. I think I remember something something like that to where, I think it, there were there were hints of that. It felt like in the uh, in the manga when they were hanging out in Komi's room, and the one character went out to go quote use the bathroom, but she was looking in and watching them interact. So, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm start I'm starting to think that she's gonna be the one that's gonna start putting them in, in scenarios to kind of get them to admit feelings for each other. There's another character too who oh, yeah? does that as well, um, and she's real fun to be around too. Cause like at first you kind of think that this girl has feelings for uh, Tadano, like as like a main character. You know, he I don't know like. It seems like they're going to set it up for him to have, like, multiple love interests. But then when she notices, like, Comey getting kind of, like, uh, jealous, she's like, oh, so this is what's going on. Oh, I'm getting involved in this thing. Actually, oh. I'm going to help <laughs> Comey out. And, you know, so kind of a cute thing. Good. So I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, the manga is a super easy read. Oh, yeah. I, um. I I discovered actually that mangas in general are really easy to read. They are. There's some that are a little bit um I don't want to say like tough to read, but a little bit more text heavy. Mhm. Mm like uh my youth romantic comedy is wrong as expected. A long title, I know. Uh I'm looking at one of those over there on my shelf and those are very text heavy, I think. The manga um for Komi it seems to be pretty fa fairly balanced. There, there's a couple of panels to where it's just um, no dialogue. It's just the uh, the pictures. Yeah, they kind of to kind of soak in uh, for for the reader to kind of to soak in the emotion of the situation, which is good. Um, that and Comey doesn't talk. So yeah, and so it, all of it needs to be displayed through facial expressions. And in the manga, uh, I don't know if this if this is displayed in the anime. Um, whenever she's really stressed out, her eyes get really big, and she and her, starts to shiver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's just all around really cute. Or when she's like excited about something, she gets cat ears that come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are so cute. <laughs> but overall, I I love the, the manga. I'm gonna try to maybe read at least ten volumes. I don't know. I don't know how many They're volumes wrap 22 up. Twenty two so far. Twenty two. Do you think that'll wrap up the first season? I think it's gone past that. Okay. I'd be really interested, especially since 
um, the Yandri is only in the se- second or third episode. And how many episodes um, is the first season? Twelve. Twelve. So my assumption would be possibly somewhere around volume six of the manga might be where the first season ends. Maybe? Okay. If I had to guess. Cool. So. All right. Now that's enough for for Komi for now. Uh, but um, real quickly, Connor, tell me about the summer anime. The su- the summer anime thing that you were telling to me off the air. So there. It just started a brand new season of anime, so the previous season is either just wrapping up or wrapped up a week or so ago for a lot of anime seasons. So, for instance, the most current season of Komi that was airing literally just got its final episode. Um, So that season ended, a new one started, and some like the three standouts for me this season um, are going to be Rent-A-Girlfriend Season 2 is out. Um, Dan Machi, or Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon, gets its fourth season, I believe. Lily was, was telling me about that. I'm interested in it. I think you'd like that one. It, it's not quite as slapstick as Konosuba, but it has a lot of, like, funny stuff in it. Um, and it's set in that kind of fantasy world. Okay. Um, and then the other one, which is a high dive exclusive is when will Ayumu make his move? It's made by the same people who made Teasing Master Takagi-san. Okay. And it takes place uh, in high school where there's a, I want to say she's like a senior and he is like a junior or sophomore or whatever, the, the main boy, Ayumu. And he joins a shogi club with his senpai and she's like, super short and like awkward and clumsy and stuff but she's like a shogi master and he is kind of her opposite in every way like he's very athletic and good at most things but he can never beat her at shogi and he basically states like in the very beginning like i'm not going to tell her my feelings for her until i can beat her at shogi what's shogi uh it is a like a tabletop game where you have these uh, little pieces. It's very similar to like a chess scenario, I think. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to play it, but it looks cute. <laughs> cool. All right, so today's episode, where we have uh, two games, uh, Caller Juarez and uh, Little Nightmares. But before we get into those, Connor, let's get physical. Make me. Oh, I will. <laughs> Let me just turn off the recording here. I'm going to make a man out of you. (laughs) Help me! Yeah, we have a lot of games this week. Oh, really? As opposed to the last few where we've had like one or two. Fuck yeah. So the first one, we were able to slip it in in time, is the Aerial Knights Never Yield. And that is $35, only on Switch, and it's a super rare exclusive. It says only 4,000 copies. But on their website, it said only 3,000 copies, so I'm not sure what to believe. Their Hmm. Twitter said one thing, and their website said another. But regardless, limited. And it says, take the role of Wally, a mysterious character that has recovered what was taken from him. Having uncovered something that could change his city forever, he's now on the path to exposing the truth. Hopefully, you're fast enough to outrun your enemies. This game goes on sale on July 21st while supplies last. Nice. The next one is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. This is $35, available on Switch, PS4, and Xbox One, and it's a somewhat wide release. I think it's kind of a limited run games thing, but I've seen it on Amazon and, and stuff as well. Um, it is. It says uh, it features groundbreaking gameplay rooted in timeless classic brawling mechanics. Brought to you by the beat-em-up experts at .mu, dot, dot .mu uh, who made Streets of Rage 4 and Tribute Games. Bash your way through gorgeous pixel art environments and slay tons of hellacious enemies with your favorite turtle, each with his own skills and moves, making each run unique. A classic edition is also available from Limited Run Games and includes a steelbook, art booklet, VHS tape box, stickers, and a Pizza Hut coupon. There's a big box version for PC that's available. Includes the game on CD and USB, a steelbook, a mouse pad, stickers, and a Pizza Hut coupon. And then there's a Radical Edition available for $200. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Includes an 
action figure packaging, steelbook, deluxe playset style box, mini arcade cabinet replica, soundtrack CD, art booklet, VHS tape box, strategy guide, poster, 3D shadow box, exclusive action figure, stickers, and a Pizza Hut coupon. And the pre-orders for that one end July 24th. So is this a brand new Teenage Mutant, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, or is this like a, a, re, a remake of a previous game? I think it's a new one. But just done in the style of the old ones. Okay. So it's been getting really good reviews. Sweet. The next one is Dragon Lapis. It's $35. Available on PS5 and PS4, but the PS4 is sold out at this time. It's a limited run games exclusive. And it says, make a return to the golden age of RPGs with 8-bit graphics and chip tunes. By unlocking growth plates, characters are able to strengthen parameters, learn skills, and increase job rank. Master multiple jobs and live an adventure full of challenge and dungeons to explore. Pre-orders in July 24th. All right. The next one is Raiden 4 X Mikado Remix and Raiden 5 Director's Cut Dual Pack. It's a mouthful. It's $50. It's only on Switch. Limited Run Games exclusive. It says arcade hit Raiden first left its mark on the shooting genre 25 years ago. The easy-to-learn, hard-to-master series comes to the Nintendo Switch in its most modern and advanced form yet. Join the war for Earth's future, where the tide of battle holds constant surprises. Pre-orders in July 24th. Oh, man, we still got so many more. I'm jam. <laughs> Jesus. The, I there know. There's a lot. Fuck. So if you want games, you're going to spend a lot this month. Oh, yeah. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. It's $60. It's only on Switch, and it's a wide release. It says, live to fight and fight to live in a warring world with a dark secret. Join Noah and, My or Noah and Mio, members of two opposing nations at the center of this conflict, on a heartfelt journey to end the cycle of violence. A group of six characters from these nations join together to awaken the colonies of Aeonios to the underlying threat both nations face. Traverse massive, fantastical sci-fi landscapes as you expose the true enemy pulling the strings behind the conflict. A special edition was available directly from Nintendo, but has sold out. It included a steelbook, special edition box, and hardcover art book. Releases July 29th. Have you played any of the Xenoblade Chronicles games? I tried playing uh, the one on the Wii U. I think it was X, but mm -hmm. I didn't get very far. Is it a turn-based game, or is it like a hack and slash? Mm -hmm. I think the latter. I can't remember. It was a long time ago that I played I remember it. a lot of people recommending it. Um, for people who are waiting for Elden Ring to come out, but that's that's the only thing I know about it. I don't even know if they're even remotely related. No, I think they're a lot different. Yeah, but, but uh, who knows? Yeah, the next one is Digimon Survive, sixty dollars available on Switch, PS4, and Xbox One. It's a wide release. This tactical RPG video game focuses on storytelling and turn-based battles. Takuma Momozuka goes on a school camping trip only to find himself transported to a mysterious world full of monsters and danger. Join Takuma and Agumon as you craft your story and fight your way back home in Digimon Survive. Releases July 29th. And then the last two are Evercade games. Mm. We don't have a lot of these. Uh, so the first one is the Jaleco Arcade Collection 1. It's $20, only on Evercade. It's a wide release. It says the Jaleco Arcade 1 cartridge for Evercade features eight arcade games from Jaleco's arcade heyday in the 80s and 90s, including Rodland, St. Dragon, Earth Defense Force, Avenging Spirit, 64th Street, A Detective Story, Cyber Battler, P-47, The Phantom Fighter, and Astianax. Uh, releases July 29th. Nice. And final game is the Galeco Arcade Collection 2. $20, only on Evercade. It's a wide release. The Gilco Arcade 2 cartridge for Evercade features six action-packed arcade games from Spanish developer Gilco, featuring hack-and-slash platformer Big Karnak, sci-fi platformer TH Strikes Back, high-speed racing game World Rally 2, and more. Releases July 29th. Man, so many games. Ooh, that took it out of me. Uh, do you do we, do you need to to loosey goosey Loose, a little bit? Uh, loosey goosey. I'm gonna take a drink here. Mm, take a drink as well. <laughs> Precious. <sighs> All right, so let's move on to our games then. Um, let's start with Call of Juarez. Gunslinger. It's, gunslinger. Thank you. Uh, 
This is developed by Techland, which surprised me. Didn't Techland uh, de make uh, Dying Light? Mm, yes. Yes, they did. Um, so I was not expecting um, for them to make something like this. Uh, it was released in 2013 on the PC, 360, and PS3, and then later released in 2019 on the Switch. You can generally beat this in about five hours. Um, you play as a bounty hunter named Silas as he tells the story of capturing and squaring off Wild West legends while drinking in a saloon. And that's kind of how the story is, is told, where a bunch of people gather around him in a saloon and he tells his story. And the levels will change um, and sometimes reverse completely depending on Silas telling the story, which yeah. is it's, it's a very interesting way of presenting a game. Um, this is a first-person shooter with some RPG elements, and even has a little bit of um, Bulletstorm element in it to where you get points for kills. Yeah. It's not the center of it. Like You get extra points for headshots or blowing up um, dynamite out of the air or blowing up an explosive barrel, getting multiple kills. So there's elements of that in there, but um, there's a bullet time. Um, concentration is what they call it. Yeah. And they have... Two interesting mechanics in it to where um, if you're one hit away from dying, you have a chance to dodge that bullet that will kill you. And there's also a dual mode. Your your classic, um, uh, this, ain't this town ain't big enough for the two of us, and you have to have the quickest draw. Yeah, and you can kind of draw early and get a dishonorable kill. Which, who cares? Like, I don't, it, it doesn't really make a difference on how the game, uh, turns out really i don't at least nothing that i saw i would assume it's just tied to like achievements probably but who cares you're 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 killing a bad guy like there is no honor in the, in that <laughs> yeah it's honorable just to get rid of him exactly <laughs> so my thoughts on this game i i liked the cell shaded look um when i first heard about this game and was interested in this game i didn't realize it was a um it, it was a cell shaded style um, which I was pleasantly surprised at. Um, however, there's there's a really big caveat to this game that Connor and I noticed. If you play this game, wholeheartedly recommend to play it on the Switch. Yes. Because I think they did something with the game on the Switch in order for it to look better and perform better. Connor played it on the PS3. Mm -hmm. And I didn't... I was kind of questioning things at first and and maybe and for a while he thought he was crazy because when I showed him pictures on my Switch he was like, "Yeah, my game does not look that good. What's going on here?" Mm -hmm. It wasn't until we got together a couple nights ago to play like side by side is when I saw just how bad this game looks on PS3. Yeah. It's it's a rough game like uh so, normally I do find the cell shaded art style nice and appealing, but I think it just does not work in its current state on PS3 at least. Like it's, it, it becomes immediately muddy, so like I couldn't make out backgrounds from characters half the time. The constant, constant screen tearing was awful to look at. No anti-aliasing. No anti-aliasing. And the frame rate at times would just drop to probably just single digits. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just bad. Like, this game, for a while, was giving me a headache to play. That's how poorly this game performs mm -hmm. on PS3. And, which is a shame because there are such good moments in this game. Like, once I kind of got an idea of how this game played... Uh, there are moments in in it to where it felt really good to shoot and kill enemies. It's just the problem is, is that they don't. The art style doesn't make the enemies distinct enough from the environment for you to easily pick them out. Correct. Um, it's not like Borderlands where like the first Borderlands has a pretty like ugly color texture for the most part, at least in the early games. But those enemies look and move distinct enough to where you can pick them out from a distance and oftentimes in borderland you're playing in like a desert 
landscape. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in this game, there's a ton of grass and foliage and stuff. So you have those dark cell shade lines mm -hmm. on on all the trees, all the grass, on the buildings, on the characters, and it just kind of just blends together into an awful looking experience. Yeah, I'm I'm curious I'm I'm curious because I want to see when the first Borderlands came out. Um 2009 okay so never mind i was because i was about to say that call of war actually no call of Juarez has no excuse for it to be as muddy as it is it's because it was released in 2013 yeah and call of Juarez isn't even like an open world game it might as well be an on rail shooter yeah and we talked about that too where i think this game in some moments would have fared better as an on rail shooter i agree i definitely think they could have done that and with how clunky the controls are at times, it probably would have performed a lot better. Oh, yeah. For real. Um, and the guns never really felt that powerful. And honestly, like, like I'm shooting with a with a lever-action rifle, like, center of mass, like, three, and take, still takes some, like, six shots to go down. Yeah. I don't know what's up with these early games and enemies being bullet sponges. It's almost as if... It's like, oh, we got to make this game harder. Let's just make, give the enemies more health. No, that doesn't make a game harder. It just makes it more annoying. Yeah. And there's a lot of times, too, in that game where there's just there's no cover. Oh, my God. Like, they will drop you in front of a bunch of guys and be like, oh, get fucked. Like, you know, it's... And there's something else about this, too. And this is something I noticed this morning when I was playing is there was a tooltip at the bottom saying the uh the paper tears like you know when you get shot there's like like bullet holes that would appear on your screen um the tooltip said that those paper ta tears tell you the direction in which you're being shot that's com that's a complete lie yeah that is a complete lie that tooltip should not be there um and e and even then the little red bar that tells you the direction you're being shot doesn't help either no because there's a lot of times where the enemy is shooting you from above. Yes. And there is no indication to tell you that. Um, this is, for the most part, basic game design. One of the hardest things to do is to tell the player to look up. And so something needs to be there to incentivize the player to look up. And so far, there, there's really nothing. I mean, yeah. I mean, in some of the train levels, you're you're going through train cars, and yeah, the train cars have hatches in them, but there's nothing indicating to look up. Like, okay, it's a hatch on a train car. What's so sign significant about that? Yeah, your aw your spatial awareness in that game is just so low all the time, and I think the bad performance coupled with the fact that every time you're shot your screen gets harder to see on. So it's already a hard game to look at. Your your spatial awareness is pretty low to begin with, and they make matters worse by, you know, making your screen visibility go down the more you're shot at. Mm -hmm. So there's times where I literally was like, I can't fucking see. I can't see anything. And I tried to make it better. I will say if you're going to play this game on one of the older consoles, maybe grab this maybe invest in an m classic which is a device that you can hook up to the hdmi cable and feed into your game system that adds uh upscaling anti-aliasing anti-aliasing and sharpness that's interesting let me see that yeah i have one of those and i put it on and i would say while it didn't fix everything it probably made it about 50 percent better cool I'm interested in this. Yeah, it works on like pretty much any 1080p or lower console. Interesting. And see, that's actually interesting you brought that up because while I was watching you play the game, I suggested that maybe if we scaled your TV down to 720, it would fix the, at least the screen tearing. Yeah. And I think where the game had its worst moment... Uh, was actually after you left and I played and reached the final level which is after you beat chapter 8 you go back to chapter 7 
and you have to fight the ghosts of all of these like outlaws and uh just when you thought the visibility of the enemies couldn't get any worse yeah they're translucent and they put you in the middle of a graveyard with no cover and they send six or more of them at you at a time i died so many times and the save points were very they had been generous up until that point not anymore they were just like up oh, you gotta restart the whole sequence and i was screaming at my screen because you could not see the enemies. They can walk through cover because they're ghosts, and it seemed like at times they were shooting through what little cover they were in the tombstones. Mm. So it was just death, 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 death. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why? Why, did, why do games have to make the last level of the game trash? Especially, especially those early games. Like I think they've gotten better um, as games evolved, but... Ga- Some are games between like, um, two thousand. I would say two thousand eight to two thousand fifteen is when is they they they've had that issue. A lot of games, not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. But there's there's one thing I forgot to mention about this game early on is this game does have RPG elements. Like you can level, like you can level up, um, your character, I gain XP and. I would say at best the upgrades that you get are mild. Yeah, you I, really I don't feel them. any more powerful um, at level one than I did like level twelve. Yeah, and the gun upgrades they might get more power, but it just seems mostly cosmetic. Exactly. Um, it's like it claims like one of the pistols that you get does like fifteen percent accurate. Excuse me, uh, fifteen percent accuracy. I don't really notice anything. It's it's it still feels like the enemies go down these, with the same amount of bullets as you did without upgrading them. Yeah. Which here's the thing: if the difference in you leveling up is negligible, don't have an RPG element in it. Yeah. Simple as that. Just make it an automatic. Exactly. Thing. Overall, like even though there were some good moments in in this game, I would generally give this game maybe a six out of ten. I think on PS3, I got to give it a five. Yeah. I liked the story a lot. That was its only saving grace, though. Mm. The controls, the visuals, and the performance were all awful on PS3. Yeah. It may be a different experience on PC, and it definitely was a different experience on Switch. So, Even though I, st- I still... C- it's really funny. I still can't quite wrap my head around the um, AXBY buttons on Switch because Xbox is so ingrained in my head that whenever I see B, I immediately go for the um, uh, which the uh, the right button. Mm. So, so and any time we had those quick time events, I I would fuck it up because I'm so used to Xbox. Jeez. Which that's not the game's fault. That's that's purely my fault. But well, you know, I'm just bad at video games. Yeah, we know. We know. <laughs> it, it it would be and which we'll get into with it with our next game which is little nightmares uh this is developed by tarsier studios released in 2017 on the pc ps4 and xbox and then 2018 on the switch and then 2020 on the stadia you can generally beat this in about three and a half hours um, in Little Nightmares, you play as a nine-year-old girl nicknamed Six, who dreams of a woman wearing a uh, kimono, and he- she seeks her out aboard the Maw, an underwater vessel. Okay. I actually had to go- Google what the story was, because um, Connor and I, we played this game earlier, and we kind of fell off of it, and then we figured that this show would be a good reason to kind of get back into it and finish it. So, full disclosure, we kind of jumped into this game about halfway through. Even but still, yeah, um, this is a two two point five D platformer where you solve puzzles while being pursued by grotesque monsters. As you go on, you it seems your character experiences hunger, and these are just story beat beat moments. Like I don't think there's anything that um, hinders you from any chase scenes with your hunger. I don't think so. But and then there's every once in a while you see like gnomes that you can find. They'll you kind of see them scuttle around around the level and everything. Yeah, I think those are just Easter eggs and collectibles, basically. Yeah. Um, you can also find lanterns that you can light, 
uh, I think those serve as, as manual checkpoints. Yes. The game the game auto saves pretty uh, generously. I think those lanterns are just an extra way to kind of save certain certain points of the game. Yeah. So my thoughts of this game, I absolutely love the look of this game, the aesthetic of the game. The monster design is incredible. Mm-hmm. And first thing, are we small or, or are these guys just really huge? I don't know. I don't know if we ever know. I, I think that's left up to interpretation. I I generally think um, six. I like the idea of six being normal size of a nine year old girl, and these monsters being huge. I yeah. find that much scarier. Yeah, personally. So, and the puzzles are pretty well thought out without being cheap. They're subtle enough to where it takes some thinking, but they're not. They don't pull an ever forward and be like, "I never would have thought about that." Yeah. Um, which with which, which <laughs> ever forwards kind of our bar <laughs> when it comes to puzzle games. Yeah, that poor studio. They're gonna be compared for a long time until we play a worse game. <laughs> yeah. Um so however, despite all these good things that we're gonna talk about with Little Nightmares, I wanna say something. Like Call of Juarez, there is a recommended console to play this game on. Do not play this game on switch yes because i think the whole point of this game is for you to die a lot trial and error until you kind of figure it out absolutely as a result the load times for the switch is god awful yep. um, we timed it 45 seconds 45 seconds for a single portion of a level it could be a single room that requires very little time to load 45 seconds and this game was running directly off the cartridge we verified it yeah and so when you have a game to where you need to kind of do trial and error a 45 second load time is punishing and it's yeah. it's frustrating there are times where connor and i played because we played this game side to side i i came over to his house and we would Swap. switch off every once in a while we, we, we figured it'd be kind of a cool switch up to kind of experience the game at the same time. But there were times we were trying to figure out how the puzzle works where we would load literally five seconds dead. And then we had to sit through another 45 second load screen. Yeah. We spent, Josh, three or four hours playing mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. And for a three hour game. Yeah. And we had, for, for reference, we had already played the first two chapters of the game already. Mm -hmm. So... If you totaled that all out, we probably spent, gosh, eight or more hours on this game. Yeah, over the period of time we played it, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but despite all of that, though, this game was a lot of fun. I liked the the creepy story. Mm -hmm. The only real complaints I had were the load times, and at times the controls were a bit clunky. Yeah, um, it it take took me a long time to kind of understand how the controls work. Um, I I, may, I sometimes got the crouch and um, the grab mixed up mm -hmm. because I think by design, six moves slowly to kind of up that tension. Yes. And a lot of times I forgot that you could sprint in this game. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> and that that's more me, me than anything. But this, the, which honestly, I don't think the sprint makes that much of a difference. Did you notice any difference in speed? It does. Yeah. yeah. You you definitely run faster. But, oh, man. I It makes me want to play the second game because we played a little bit of the second game. And the load screens on the PS5 were instantaneous. Yeah. So it's nowhere near punishing. But this game, despite everything, I want to try to play this game again on my own. I want to experience this game in full with, like, like, how, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Without a, such a big break in between. Yeah, and I mean, if you really want to play it again with probably much better load times, I have a copy of it on PC, on Steam. Ooh, okay, but, and we, we're family sharing right now, so there's yeah. my chance to just p plug in my Xbox controller and go. Exactly. So, but, oh, but this game was so good. I love this game. Like, this... I think the scariest part of of this game 
was one when Mr. Grabby Hands, which I actually looked up on the on the uh, wiki. His name is the janitor. Okay, <laughs> but he's Mr. Grabby Hands. To yeah, us. to us he's Mr. Grabby Hands because he's he has a very short stature, but super long arms. Yes. And so, like, re- like really gangly arms too. Oh yeah, they're like three times his body length. And he's blindfolded too, so he operates just on sound. Yes. And it took us a long time for him to kind of figure out, like, um, the monkey with the symbols throwing that, and then t- then timing that. Um, but there was a moment for me where, um, you were like in some pipes, and there were holes on the wall. You would pass the first hole, um, and nothing would happen, and my adrenaline was still going. Mm-hmm. I passed the second hole. He reaches in, grabs me, and pulls me in. And you screamed? <laughs> I did. I screamed like a little... Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the scariest moment for me was when we saw the Geisha for the first time. Oh, yeah. Her, and, her little humming. Yes. And you like have to sneak behind her, and then... The game, you can like hear your heartbeat, mm-hmm. and she's just humming and brushing her hair, and it's like, and, uh... and, you, and doing nothing at all. And it turns out that she's ethereal. Yes. And they fuck with you hard. And this, this is the final moments of the of the game. No spoil. Like this, this game doesn't doesn't have a big enough story to where there's spoilers. Really, um, really, the spoilers, and I say that in in quotes, is just the scares. Yes. But. What they, but anyway, they fuck with you hard with this woman because she can just appear. They have mannequins strategically placed to make you think that she's in one of the, those corners, and that's actually one of the big um things about her boss fight. Yeah, and I think the boss fight and the end was actually really good in this game. Mm-hmm. It was satisfying. Because the ending is is because she's ethereal. If you point a mirror at her, it it hurts her. Mm-hmm. And so, at, when you when you play through the game, there's times where your hunger overtakes you, and you would have to eat something. And six eats more and more grotesque things as as the story progresses. Like rats I, and and the and what the gnome? Yeah, it's offering you a sausage, and instead you eat it. Yeah. And we were like, what the fuck? Yeah, I know. It was messed up. But And then you eat her at the end, and then you gain her abilities. And all those grotesque which grotesque monsters, which the wiki says that the, they're called visitors. Okay. Um, the the group that chase, that chases you mm-hmm. as they were eating. You start, like, picking them up and killing them as you, as you just walk down the hallway as an unstoppable monster. Yeah. It was super satisfying. It makes the second game a lot more interesting because that character shows back up in the second game Mm -hmm. but i don't think that at least what we've played of the second game i don't think she's shown any powers yet but maybe eventually she does yeah i'm i i really want to play this game i'm almost tempted to after we're done recording go 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 back down and play a little (laughs) bit of it yeah yeah um but overall i would give this game like an eight and and the and I, i would give this game a higher score because I think this game does deserve a higher score. The problem is, is just we played it on the Switch, and I just, that's why I have to give it an eight. I'd have to even be more mean to it. I'd have to give it probably a six on the Switch. I if if you played it on any other platform where it loaded faster, yes, I'd agree at the eight. On the Switch, it's like a six because we were just constantly frustrated sitting there waiting a full forty five seconds for this mm-hmm. game to load. How would this game be if we were if we had an edible before? Do you think this game would be scarier? Uh, we would have a much harder time playing. <laughs> these, Probably these puzzles would be much more challenging. But yeah, those are the two games that that we. Well, yeah, those are the two games. I I I feel so bad. I was I was so ready to come in where I'm well rested and I'm just I guess I'm just forever brain dead. Well, you know, I'm used to it. Yeah, my gerbil brain, my adhd but next week we have um i guess some classic games i i've never seen um demetrios i never heard of demetrios it's not that old but it, it's an, a little bit older of a game but i'm excited to play renegade so yeah. so demetrios and renegade is our next week's games and that'll just about do it for us thank you guys so much for listening and we will see you guys next time